There are a lot of theists or religious people who think that, um, you know, they want to condemn atheists because, you know, oh, well, you, you guys don't uh, have any proof that there is no God, but yet you expect us to have proof. proof. And, you know, we've all heard this before, and we've all tried to make the point to them, which apparently they don't listen to a lot of times, that, um, you know, atheism is not like a world view, and we, don't, we aren't the ones making a claim. We're just basically refuting a claim, which I've said in other videos before. But, you know, bears, you know, I think it's good to, to keep saying because apparently, you know, like I said, they just, they can't get this in their head. Um, and this is what I find so strange about this is like they, they have to admit at some point or another that there is no proof or evidence of their God or for their God. Although they'll try to throw things out there, they'll go back and forth with you, and then when it comes down to it, they'll say, well, you know, I'm not saying that I can prove that my God. Well, of course you can't. That's why faith is involved. That's why faith is required of you. And, you know, for this God or this religion or that religion. If that weren't the case, then there would be no mention of faith. You wouldn't need faith. And, you know, what is missed, I think, a lot on a lot of these people is that a lot of atheists, myself included, have not decided that they don't believe in God primarily because of the lack of evidence. Yes, that's a big part of it. But it's because they come to the conclusion after reading the doctrine, reading the story about said God, that this God is not even worthy of worship, even if he were to exist, speaking primarily of the Christian God. Um, and, you know, that's something that I don't think even they ask themselves a lot of times. They just, oh, well, you know, I'm Christian because my parents are Christian and it's the right thing to do. And, you know, they've kind of gotten indoctrinated into this religion without actually reading the Bible and thinking for themselves, you know, does this make sense? You know, is this a just God? If this God is saying that he's A, B, C, and D, then, then when I look at these stories, do those things fall in line? You know, in other words, they don't go at it with like a common sense approach or a logical approach in the sense that you're just looking at does it make sense or not. You know, based on what I'm given, because this is all I'm given, is this Bible. And, and you know, yeah, you can also look at people who are Christians and look at, you know, how their lives are, how they behave. I think that's part of it. I think that's a legitimate thing to look at. You know, how do these people live their lives that are believing in this God? Because... If this God is truly a God and he has conveyed his message in what I would imagine or, you know, what should be an accurate way. Okay, sorry, my battery died. Um, so anyway, like I was saying, uh, you know, any God that is a God would be able to convey his message um, accurately and in a way that is clear. And, you know, the first thing before you even read the Bible, before you even decide what religion you are or... You know, even if you're, you know, looking into Christianity and you want to know for sure, is this the God for me, and so on and so forth. Before you even read any of that, you can look and see how there is so much um, confusion and ambiguity over what people think this God is saying, you know, how people have interpreted the Bible in so many different ways. There's so many different religions. Even within, you know, the God of Abraham, there's like how many religions just for that God? or branches of that religion. That in and of itself is a strike against the idea that this God is a real God. In the sense of what a God should be, especially a God who supposedly created the universe and everything that's in existence. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, not so much that, oh, you have to use logic, and that's, I mean, you know, the, the thing that I'm saying as far as common sense is, is that and, you know, looking at, well, is all these things that this God is saying that he is, does it go along with, you know, how he's depicted in the Bible? Because that's the only thing you have to go along, you know, to go with or to look at. Um, I mean, there's things that just, generally speaking, that you can look at and you can say, well, you know, none of this makes sense. Um, I mean, just looking at the difference between, like, you know, for example, between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God who is, you know, a.k.a. Jesus Christ. 
there is such a fundamental difference between those two entities that, um, you know, I, I mean, just that in and of itself just takes a kind of a common sense approach that these cannot be the same entities because what Jesus Christ teaches is fundamentally different than what the God of the Old Testament did or acted like. And, you know, there's so many um, human character characteristics that you can see being displayed by the God of the Old Testament, especially. And that, to me, says a lot. Now, a lot of Christians will say, well, that's because, you know, God was trying to put it in a format that we could understand and da-da-da-da-da. Okay, well, if God does that, if he tries to gauge his message, you know, based off of the audience receiving it, then you look back in the Old Testament and, you know, you could say, well, these people didn't know how to read or something like that. So that's why he just didn't do the Bible at that point. You know, at that point, he was down there actually performing miracles and smoting people and, uh, you know, showing up on the mountain and showing up in the burning bush. And, you know, angels were, you know, active and present and people knew it and knew that they were from God. And, you know, so there was a lot more of a hands-on approach at that point. But, you know, what if... What I don't understand is, you know, it took however many, what, thousands of years before there was actually a divinely inspired book about said God. So it makes you wonder, why was it in the Old Testament, you know, he didn't just, you know, divinely inspire a book at that point? Well, you could say, well, because these things that he did and these miracles that he was doing and uh, you know, that he was doing that to show who he was and blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, why doesn't he do that now? Well, their excuse for that is that, well, because we're supposed to be more mature as believers now, whereas then we were like baby believers. And so then we needed those um, hands-on approach kind of lessons because, you know, we were too ignorant then to, to be just of the faith and have this book and then just believe it and so on and so forth. Well, obviously that's not working, number one. Number two, you know, you can't say that the people back, you know, like the, the Hebrews or whatever back in the Old Testament time or the Jewish people, you can't say that they didn't know how to read. Otherwise that, you know, why, he, he gave the Ten Commandments, he had them, you know, chiseled them in the stone, right? So obviously they could read. But I mean, if he was there, you know, why didn't he just tell them these things? You know, which I guess in a sense he did. By through his chosen... Uh, mouthpiece, which I believe was Moses, you know, so he kind of did in a sense, but what was the point of the tablets, and what was the point of etching it in stone, and, and if that was such a good way to convey your message, which apparently writing stuff down in God's mind is a good way to convey your message, because thus the Bible, why not just do it that way in the beginning, instead of smoting all these people, and you know, what have you, you know, why not just say, okay, this is what you do, here's your free will, you know, see how it goes. And that's another thing. You know, these are all things you can kind of figure out prior to even reading the Bible, but obviously if you read the Bible, you can even see it even clearer, I think, if you're open to it. Um, you know, uh, supposedly you have free will, but yet, you know, as a Christian, you're taught that nothing happens outside of God's will, which makes sense, because if there is a God... And, and he is really a God, then, you know, obviously whatever he wants to have happen is going to happen. So, in other words, how do you call it free will when everything is happening in, within the scope of God's interest or God's intent? Nothing can happen that God does not want to have happen. Okay, so there's that. It doesn't make sense. Because everything that you see that happens in the Bible, you know, like I said, there's so many human characteristics with this guy. He's, um, he, there's anger, there's arrogance, there's rage, there's jealousy. Um, and a lot of these things are sinful things, too. Um, I mean, he's a tyrant in a lot of aspects. And, you know, and, and, you know the Christians make so many apologetics for this. They apologize so much, try to make excuses or come up with these crazy explanations for why he did this or why he did that. But the reality of it is, if you're going to really be honest with yourself, if you're really trying to find truth in what you believe, and, and, and really try to get to know this God that you are worshiping and spending all this energy on and time on and trying to get other people to believe, you know, when you sit down and you read the Bible, you can't tell me, unless you have no conscience of your own, 
that when you read that, you know, for instance, you know, God smote some guy because he's picking up sticks on the wrong day. I don't, I don't remember where that was at, but I've heard it mentioned before and I know it's in there. When you come across things like that, and you, you know, I mean, at first, when you, you know, when, when you think you're a believer and you're trying to study the Bible, you're like, oh, you know, my God's a motherfucker. You know, he'll kick your ass if you don't do what he wants you to do. And you're kind of proud of that at first. I kind of think that's kind of cool at first. But then the more you start thinking about it, it's like, wait a minute. This is supposed to be, this God attributes himself to love itself. You know, he says he is love. And, 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 and in trying to make us understand his place in our lives and who he is and what he is, he calls himself the Father. And we're like his children. You don't do that to your children. You don't teach your children in that way. And, you know, they, the Christians will say, oh, well, you know, we're not, you know, we're not God, though. We're not God, though. We're not supposed to understand, you know, why he does these things. Well, if we're not supposed to understand... If we're not capable of understanding the mind of God, why did he divinely inspire a book to try to get us to understand it? Because obviously he knew that we wouldn't understand it. He's omniscient. And other people have argued this before too, that this omniscience thing just doesn't work with what we're seeing happening with this God. The whole free will thing gets blown out of, out of the water um, and a lot of these other excuses made for him. And I've just recently been in an argument with somebody, I don't remember what the name was of the person. I'll put it in the details or what have you. But, you know, they were trying to say that, uh, uh, basically, you know, trying to undermine the whole thing that you can see in the Bible as far as that everything that's happening in the Bible, you can see when you're reading it, that is all God's plan. You know, everything that's being orchestrated comes back down to God is making it happen. You know, like the first mention of Pharaoh, for instance, and I have to argue with a lot of people about this. Not, not the Pharaoh that wouldn't let the people go. There was a Pharaoh prior to that. And I believe it was, uh, I think it was Joshua or whatever. It was because of him and what happened with him that caused the initial Pharaoh, the first Pharaoh mentioned in the Bible, to, to have everything regarding the, the Jewish people, the Hebrews or whatever. The reason why they were slaves, in other words, I mean, and not to say that he maybe wasn't a bad, you know, maybe he was a bad guy, you know, or evil or whatever, and maybe he made them into some kind of servitude, but it, it distinctly, I believe, says in there, and I'll have to look this up, that it was, you know, that Joshua kind of turned over everything that the Hebrews had to the Pharaoh. In other words, it was Joshua that put Pharaoh in control completely of these people. He gave Pharaoh the ability to be able to do this. while he was in favor of the Pharaoh. And we all remember that story <clears throat> with the coat and all that stuff and yada, yada, yada. If not, then read it. I highly suggest it. Highly recommend it. So, anyway, you know, because I'm always pointing out to people, well, who hardened the Pharaoh's heart? You know, and this is the Pharaoh that didn't let the people go. It says in there, I don't know how many times, that God hardened his heart. And God even explicitly de explains in detail why he did this. He's doing this because he wants to be the Savior. He wants people to know that he's the Savior. So in order to be the Savior, there has to be a calamity. There has to be a problem. So basically, you can actually see that God is actually setting up this problem. And he's using his own force, his own will on these people to do this. And to me, that's dishonest. And then turning around and saying, you know, and, and you have all these Christians saying, oh, well, no, the Pharaoh, you know, he, he, he was like that before, and God didn't make him that way. Well, that's not what it says. You can't just make stuff up and say, this is really who my God is. All you have to go on is the Bible. You have to go by what it says. And it's, and it's ironic, because when you're a new Christian, or a baby Christian, whatever they call it nowadays, you know, they tell you that when you're reading the Bible, you have to, you know, you should even pray that you're not using, you're not leaning on your own understanding. And I used to really try to drive that home in my head that, you know, I want to read this with an open mind. I don't want to lean on what I want it to say or what I want it to be. I want it to be what it is. I want to know the truth. And, you know, this is what I have to go on. So I'm going to try to be as objective about it as possible. And Christians really push that. But yet it seems like they don't follow that advice. Because how can you tell me that the Pharaoh was acting on his own will? When it explicitly says that God hardened his heart more than once. 
And God explains why he does this, why he's doing this, that he's making it to where, in other words, he's making the Pharaoh not want to let the people go. And, you know, then, thence, you know, forward, you move forward, and he's putting all these plagues on them and doing all this stuff, killing all these innocent children of Egypt, Egyptian children or whatever. What do they have to do with it? Nothing. You know, so it gets to the point, if you have a conscience, that if you're really reading this and you're really being objective about it, you're not trying to make it say what you want it to say because you really want to believe this. And I think usually that's what happens. People maybe gloss over this stuff and they're really not looking for truth. They just, you know, have already accepted it. And that's where it gets into the, well, are you being logical or are you being illogical? Because logic would say that you read it with an open mind, look at it for what it is, and then decide if you believe it or not. But a lot of these people are believing it prior to examining it. And that is illogical. You should look at what it is first and then decide, do I believe this? You can't just, you know... So, and you know, that's another thing that a lot of times Christians do, well, you have to have faith, you have to have faith, and you have to really, you know, if you don't have, you have to read this on faith, and no, you read it logically. That's the only way not to be duped or tricked. That's the only way not to be, you know, hallucinating or having an illusion about something that, it, that you want to have be real that isn't real. Logic dictates that. And then, you know, there's the book of Job, which I've pointed out to a lot of people. you got Job. Supposedly they make the argument that free will is so that you have a choice. The only reason that God, even though they have a hard time with this, God created evil. God created the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God was the one that put it there. God created it. God put it there. God created everything. So you can't say he didn't create evil, okay? So let's start there. But their reasoning for that is that, well, if he didn't, then there would be no free choice. And he gives us free will and da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, you have to have a good choice and a bad choice to choose from. Otherwise, what's the point of having free will? Well, I guess there isn't any. Because my argument is always, well, what was wrong with how it was prior to Eve eating the apple? Why couldn't it just stay like that? I didn't think there was a problem with that. We knew God. God knew us. There was no problems. Then the next thing you know, there's this damn tree. We're told not to eat it. And, you know, oh, well, because he wanted to see if we'd be obedient to him. He wants us to love him. And there's other ways to go around that besides, you know, tricking people with trickery. Because that's what that was. And so, anyway, move forward to the Job story, as I had brought up already. And I've, I've made this argument with a lot of people that if free will is for the purpose of knowing if we'll obey or not. In other words... You could say it this way. If free will is for us to choose out of a fallen world the righteous choice, to be righteous even though we're living in a fallen world, which to me, that's what the Bible is saying. That's what God is trying to say that he's doing with that. Well, then what was the point of Job being tested? Job was already righteous. It says so. He was already righteous. It was like God and Satan were in a bar having a drink and, you know, Satan was like, hey, I'll, let me make this bet with you. And then, you know, and he makes this bet that, you know, your righteous servant Job will denounce you if you take away everything that you've given to him. And so the argument with the Christians for that, or the excuse, I should say, is that, well, you know, you know even people that are saved or even Christians get tested. Why? Well, because, you know, even Christians or people who are saved are still sinners. You're born a sinner. Okay, so you're born a sinner, but even if you're a righteous person, evidently, according to the doctrine, even if you're a righteous person, you know, God might, just for the sole purpose of um, winning a bet with Satan, because that's so important, you know, he might just decide to take everything away from you that he gave to you, supposedly, initially. Um just for that reason, even if you're righteous. So what's a, so you guys act like, oh, well, if you're an atheist, what's the point of being good? You don't have any reason to be good. You're not being good to keep yourself from going to hell, and you're not being good so you can get into heaven, and, you know, therefore you're all heathens. And it's always assumed that we're heathens or that we're incapable of being humble to a God. You know, we're just incapable of that. So, you know, that's my point, you know. It's just, it, you got to be logical about what you believe. And if there is no logic in what you believe, then you need to rethink that and 
you need to quit trying to spread this thing around like as if it's truth and expecting people who don't believe it to have some kind of evidence against it because that's kind of hypocritical. You don't have any uh, logical evidence to believe what you're believing, not even reasoning. So I shouldn't call it logic. I mean, you're not even reasoning with yourself first. Is this a reasonable God? Is this a reasonable thing to be believing in and basing my whole life off of? And, you know, I mean, yeah, a lot of people, well, you know, there's a lot of good precepts and, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeah, a lot of that is good. And a lot of atheists still, you know, live by those things. I think it's good, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a good friggin' idea. There is a lot of good ideas in the Bible. That doesn't mean that the whole thing is accurate or true. And it doesn't mean that a God exists. It just means that there's some good ideas in it. And you can still adopt what is good without adopting the whole religion without adopting that, oh, this God is true and everybody else should believe that this God is true. And dang it, if you don't believe in this God, then where's your evidence? Where's your proof? Where's yours? I mean, you know, at least show me the reasoning first. And you know dang well that you can't prove that this God exists. You can't even prove that the Bible is 100% accurate. And you certainly can't, you know, can't prove that it makes common sense because you haven't even thought about that yourself something to think about.